So hello every everyone. Welcome to a Spring 35 demo. So today we are gonna introduce you what's gonna be new in the version 1.14 of Kiale, and we'll see uh, awesomeness from from Jigger team and Kiale console. Uh, today it's gonna be talking Yuka, Mike, me, and Pavel. So yeah, uh, Yuka, when you want is yours. Okay, sure. So let me start sharing my screen. And hopefully you now see a video that I recorded earlier today. Good. So let me bring here. As you can see, uh, I recorded it a few hours ago. Um, the reason is mainly because it, it's, um, it takes some time for everything to work. And, you know, Sorry, Ijuka. We are seeing your uh, Blue Jean, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, what about now? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, again, you can see the date on the top of my screen here. Uh, it's 1 p.m. So uh, it's a few hours ago. Uh, and this is a fresh OpenShift cluster. And the feature that I'm uh, demoing today is um, the uh, horizontal pod of this kit. Right, so basically, I'm creating here a new project, so a new namespace on on a OpenShift cluster, and I'm deploying um, you know the whole um, operator um, from scratch, so it's running on my machine, and um, I deployed also search to serve as the background, as the backend storage for for our instance. Then um, once the Elastic Search is ready. We create a new Jaeger instance, so we trade the name uh, tracing. So it's code here. Um, you see that it's a Jaeger resource named tracing, and this is currently using a, a an image that I pushed based on on today's master of Jaeger, so Jaeger collector, because that uh, has a new flag uh, so that we can control the size of the queue based on memory allocation instead of items. And we, we then further uh, configure the CR to say um, how many, um, how much memory do we want to request for this pod or for this uh, for the collector, and based on that we are having the pod autoscaler from Kubernetes to uh, to be configured. We say that we want um, at least uh, three replicas and at most ten replicas, and we then configure that to use uh, Elasticsearch that we just deployed. Right now, um, I deploy a trace generator. So this is a uh, an application that is available on bigger trace. Um, and then I configure the trace generator to use the tracing instance that, that I just created uh, on the observability namespace, which is a project that we also created um, a couple of minutes ago. Now, the trace generator has some parameters. So we, um, we have 10 workers. And that should be enough to generate quite some load, right? right? I mean, it's only one replica. Now we have here uh, the new namespace, so observability namespace. We have the tracing collector deployment. I think this video is speeded up. Um, yeah. Okay. That's better. Um, okay, so um, now that, that I have all, everything deployed, uh, there is also a HPA, so horizontal pod autoscaler, also deployed. Um, and we see that it's uh, currently watching some metrics for our collector, so CPU and memory consumption. Um, and we have three pods available for the collector. And um, after some minutes, we would, have, we would see that it scales up um, to some more. Because so let me just keep this video here a little bit. So we see that uh, we have uh, we scale up from three to four, and then from four to seven, and eventually gets up to, sorry, eventually it gets up to 10. Um, yeah, uh, which is the maximum amount of uh, um, uh, pods that we want for that deployment. Then uh, once it reached uh, the, the maximum, then we, we undeploy the trace generator. So it's finishing scaling up to 10. And we can then 
and deploy the trace generator. Right. And once we do that, there's uh, nothing more happening on our on our namespace here, so we're not generating any, any new traffic to the collector. And eventually, the collector will then go back to um, to only three or four uh, uh, deployments. So if I so it takes quite some time because um, you know scaling up has to be very quick, and scaling down takes more time because you know it's better to stay at ten than to scale down and then back again if there's some more load. So after about 10 minutes, then it starts by scaling down. So from 10 to 8, then to 7, then to 6, and eventually uh, goes to 4 and 3. So this is available from, uh, from the Eager operator 1.17, which is not released yet. Uh, it's probably going to be released a few days after Eager 1.17. Um, and that version then, uh, by default, creates a new HPA for all the agents. And uh, yeah, so that's what I had. Cool. Thank you, Yuka. So, uh, Mike, you want to take the stage? Sure. Hello, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. We see uh, Google Docs. Right. So I'll be going over the tasks that uh, Team Saturn worked on uh, in Sprint 35. Uh, first one we have is a resource badge tooltip in the graph side panel. Um, this one's easier to show you than than to actually describe it here. Um, we had some issues before with uh, just some usability issues when on the hubbers. The hubbers actually used to be uh, would come up above and had transparency and stuff, so it was uh, difficult to read. Uh, so now at least we addressed the transparency and, and had the hubbers uh, come up to the side instead. Just a small thing, but just kind of an irritating thing. Um, we now, you're able to double click uh, when you're in the uh, zoomed in view and you can navigate to the detail screen. This is a usability feature. Uh, so for instance, so when I double click on the regular graph screen, it takes me to the zoomed in view. And now that I'm in the zoomed in view, um, if I double click, I can go directly to the details page for whatever node that is. Uh, so, so I double click there, and now we're on the applications details page. Um, so just kind of a nice handy uh, feature to quickly get to whatever nodes that you want. So for instance, um, we're on the uh, do it for a service. So take us to the services detail page. So just a quick uh, handy navigation tool there. Um, we had an issue that we fixed with the the HTTP uh, graph sparklines not showing the errors. Uh, it was only showing the successful traffic. I think this can be uh, illustrated best by just looking what the graph looked like. Um, so you can see here that we actually had uh, errors occurring in the traffic, uh, but our spark line did not show any errors. Um, so that one was also backported. Uh, focus animation changes, this was a small one. It affected the replay. When you when you started replay, it would actually you know focus the node. Um, KLE operator support for multiple version streams. Um, this wasn't merged. We're just using the, the stable channel for now. Additional operator. There was definitely a lot of uh, operator refactoring and and a bug fix uh, where the pod annotations uh, were using snake case instead of uh, camel case. And this came in from a, a community member. The Kelly hack scripts now, uh, the install scripts uh, support Istio 1.5 now. And so there's a lot of 1.5 stuff going on now uh, with the 1.5 uh, beta 2. Um, so current things were, that are still in progress uh, after the sprint are the uh, persistent queries, uh, persistent query history for the graph find hide. Um, what this would do is store all of your your queries um, and possibly um, 
some canned queries. And that's we're still going talking with UXD about this, how this is going to work, um, because they're doing a similar thing in OCP. So uh, we're kind of waiting on that. And last is the uh, the uh, details uh, mini graph. Um, so there's was a lot of work to uh, decouple the our Cytoscape stuff uh, from Redux so we could use it in multiple pages because the uh, way it currently was it, it was only we only had one graph uh, but now we need to be able to use that in in multiple screens uh, so the highlight of what that's going to look like and that should be a next sprint is like this uh, so the on the detail screens you'll have a uh, basically a contextual graph to kind of show you what what you're looking at uh, that should be a cool feature and that's it uh, for team saturn great thank you mike so um i guess uh this is a fifo first in first uh out so my turn i'm sharing my screen uh can can you see my screen my terminal Is it a yes? It looks black right yeah. now. Black. Yeah, there's okay. a black screen. Can't see any oh. text on it though. Okay. Um, I'm gonna share application window then. And do you see now a Chrome? Yes. Okay. Cool. So, a um, yeah, I I prepare four things for you that we've we've worked this sprint. So um, the first one is that uh, now Kiali is able to um, create new objects, right? Uh, before that, we were able to create multiple objects, for example, at, um, at service level, but now we are able to create two objects, gateway or sidecar objects, so you then need to go to the YAML, uh, to the terminal and build the YAML and apply it. You can just do it uh, from our console. Right now we only have two objects, but uh, the, this uh, line of work here to add new objects, is the objects for better managing your, your service mesh. For example, a uh, booking for gateway, I think it has to be the number two host. I'm going to say all the hosts and four number. So adding the server. And now I can create this. So what we can see that uh, we've created a new gateway. That, uh, yeah, it's here and it's uh, already in your service mesh. The second thing is that uh, we had uh, a bug. When we, for example, we have the reviews that has three different versions. If you create, for example, a waiting route, deciding uh, splitting the traffic to the three versions evenly. So when you create it, um, there's been uh, three different, three different objects, uh, two different objects created. But what happened if you delete uh, one version of it? Um, I'm moving to terminal. Unfortunately, you cannot see that. But if I delete a, uh, a deployment reviews, for example, version three from uh, from default. Okay. Give me a second. Uh, Kubernetes, uh, get deployments from namespace Paul, namespace default. So uh, Kubernetes delete deployment, uh, reviews, reduce V3. So I've just delete. We can go to the graph and you will okay. from here, it's going to be easier. Now we see that we have two, um, on the bottom of the screen, you see that we have two deployment instead of three. 
and we have that uh, here we have uh, uh, problems on our validation because there's um, this destination rule uses a uh, subset for version 3 which is wrong right so now if we want to update this routing this route we have now it is updated with the new number of deployments before that this wizard was uh, not updated so it had the three versions and it behaved uh, oddly right so now we can split it we can do the update and the configuration is uh, no complaints on that. That that but that uh, warning it was already there. So this is fixed. So we are still improving the wizard experience, user experience to to ease the task of uh, managing service mesh. Um, regarding Istio config um, validations, uh, this uh, sprint we've added a new validation, new set of validation for the authorization policies. This is kind of a nonsense uh, uh, object because it's, uh, it has uh, four different warnings, but it's just for showing you which, which are the validations we have here. For example, this one saying that um, this authorization policy goes to a set of uh, um, um, workloads that doesn't exist because there's no application called HTTP bin. So that, that's why it's warning you. Then, um, so uh, for example, uh, an authorization policy, it tracks all the requests. It decides where to apply this, this policy, for example, from the source, from this, this source rule, right? One of the way to define this source, this group of workloads that has to, to be applied this policy is using the namespaces. Again, here we don't have the namespace HTTP, so we are applying a kind of easy, easy way. It is a warning because it's not breaking your, your service mesh. And also another way for, for saying uh, which are the path or the subject of those policies you can use the method field saying, okay, I want to perform the policy, uh, the airbag, airbag policy to uh, all requests going to a get or going to a specific gRPC package. So here we compile, we try to, to understand which are the methods and if it's not a HTTP met method or a fully qualified gRPC name, we show you a warning, right? So we are easing this um, task for security responsibles of service mesh for not mistaking and not um, making any typo or maybe deleting objects and keeping the, the config there. And last one, and uh, one of the big uh, new features introducing this sprint are the extensions. Um, do you guys see a uh, Kiali.io webpage? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, in the next release, version 1.14, what we're going to have is Kiali extensions. Kiali extensions is a easy way for, for new products uh, on, based on Istio to get integrated with Kiali console. It's a, it's an easy way we've, simpli we've simplified how other third parties application can use a Kiali console and then can manage a specific configurations from, from, a, pro from, from a, a specific project in the console, how to enrich the actions, for example, the action from a service, how to create how to use the wizards we've seen just before for applying uh, rules on those services and also to better to enrich the graph metrics and details and of course to use visibility that Kialis have in the Istio in the Istio environment to leverage some uh, traction. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you 
kind of uh, in a quick way what what you can do right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna play with the first with the first extension we have, which is the three scale one, and um, you don't only you you have uh, you have to do two two steps right now uh, as a user of it, which is uh, creating the necessary CRDs. I'm going to terminal and I am creating all the three scale necessary uh, CRDs, and then what I need to do is add all the configuration necessary for those CRDs to the Kiali console. As you may see here, uh, we have a new a new level on uh, on our config config uh, piece in our config YAML uh, for the extensions, and then every extension has its own name, right? So I'm gonna create uh, this one, and again I'm moving outside of the of the of the Chrome, and what I'm do, what I'm gonna do is to apply this in the config YAML. So I'm applying it, and now I'm restarting the pod. So I'm restarting the pod, and you'll see what Kiali shows once once it has a the uh, the extension up. Refreshing this. And as you can see here, we have a new section, one specific and dedicated section to the extension, which is this three style config, where you can see all, you can manage all the, all the instances related to the integration. You can create one, there's one service ID three scale, uh, dummy URL, where is, um, I mean, the um the point of this uh, demo is not to talk about the uh, the uh, the T scale, but the integration, the way you can interact with the new third party uh, player here. Don't share it. Okay, so you can create you can create objects from that. You'll see. And also, this is the one of the pillars. Another pillar is the actions. So you can go, for example, to product page and integrate the three scale adapter from here. So in the actions, now you have uh, two more actions related to this to this uh, extension. So you can you can select which uh, which object you want, and this is totally configurable for you. So view, oh no, so create, and it's created, and now you can go to the Istio config, and in the Istio config, you will see, you will see uh, what the integration Kiali and uh, and the integration the third party has created for you. So what we have after that is that uh, a specific service is integrated with this third party, right? In terms of, this is in terms of user, but how it is in terms of uh, developers of, uh, if you are a new product that wants to be embedded, integrated uh, with Kiali, uh, what, what I have to do? So there's uh, two, two different things to do. We've eased, we've prepared Kiali for, for having uh, an easy way to integrate the, with the backend, so you have you have this extension, you have to add your new extension, um, add what is necessary on your operator, so all the, all the um, uh, variables you need, the settings you need to have, and then the handlers and the routes, right? And then also, and then also you have uh, to implement the, the, the front end part. And yep. That's it from my site. So let me stop sharing. And um, Pavel, uh, you wanna get in? Yeah, I will just share my screen. Good. So I think you should be, you should see my screen right now. Yes. 
Okay, so I would like to talk about uh, some kind of research uh, I was doing around instrumenting applications. And I was looking at a T-Trace. Uh, T-Trace is a tool as part of a GraalVM. But before I start, I would like to uh, explain what actually GraalVM is so we uh, understand, uh, so we have the same basic understanding. So GraalVM is a, is a basically virtual machine, which uh, in addition you know, to running uh, JVM languages, can run uh, other languages like Python, Ruby, Node.js, but also any LLVM language like C and C++. So it's kind of very powerful uh, virtual machine, you know, polyglot. Uh, what is also very interesting is that you can mix these languages together. So for example, you can write, for example, uh, JavaScript code and call your, uh, use any Java API or any C++ API. So we can, you know, completely mix languages uh, inside your application. And uh, they have also, as part of the extension of GraalVM, there is a tool called T-Trace. Uh, and the T-Trace is something like agent-like instrumentation for, uh, for maybe you are familiar with, uh, with Java agent. So it, it works in a very similar way. Uh, so let's have a look uh, at code so you can better understand how it actually works. Uh, so I have prepared a very simple Node.js application. Uh, so you see, uh, I'm just using the, the HTTP uh, package. I'm creating the server, and then I'm just logging uh, something to standard output that when I get a request, uh, then there is some timeout, like a wait, uh, and then once the you know response in, is sent or before the sending, I'm logging uh, a second a statement. So there is no tracing uh, involved in this application. The only tracing related code is here at the top. Uh, I'm just loading Jaeger client uh, package, uh, node package. Uh, and then there is a limitation in GraalVM uh, and in tree trace that it cannot load packages in the agent script. Uh, so I just have to do it here. Uh, so this is the application. So let's have a look at the instrumentation. Uh, so the instrumentation is a different file, uh, and there are two basically functions. The first one, it just creates a Jaeger tracer, you know, standard uh, Node.js uh, Jaeger open tracing implementation. Uh, I just, you know, configured the, the reporter to send the data to local, uh, in my local host and this port. Uh, and I will say that I want to sample all the requests. Uh, and the interesting function is this uh, initialize the agent, which actually instruments my Node.js application. Uh, and there are two, uh, two instrumentation points. So the first one is invoked for every, you know, every function in my application. So when a function is involved in my application, this uh, basically this function triggers. And what it does basically, it's, it uh, you know gets the uh, the frame variables and the the arguments of the function from my application. Uh, and I'm just checking you know if the arguments are are request and response, so I know that I'm in the HTTP handler method. And then I just, you know, start the, the span and, uh, and I put the span into the uh, response object. And I also put the uh, span ID into the response object. So I'm just starting the span. And then uh, the second instrumentation point is uh, when the function returns. So again, this runs for all the functions from my application. Uh, and there I'm just checking if, uh, if there is a response and if there is a response which has a span, I just, you know, log the status code uh, and finish the span. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, in, in JavaScript, you can do instrumentation explicitly. So uh, we could write uh, our, you know, starting of the spans here uh, in our kind of like business code or in the middleware. 
or we could use something like monkey patching where we would replace uh, specific, you know, like modules or I'm not sure if you call them classes, but kind of like piece of code, we would just, you know, replace them with our uh, traced alternative. Uh, so let's have a look how it works. I will go to terminal. So I will just uh, execute it. So I have to uh, call this node from GraalVM distribution. And then I'm uh, I'm passing the, the application, which is the server.js. And then I'm also supplying the trace script, which is called Jaeger uh, node.js. When I run it, uh, I know it says like agent is ready and uh, Jaeger tracer is initialized. Uh, and then I just, you know, create some requests and I will verify in the Jaeger UI whether I get the traces or not. Uh, so I see there is some data coming uh, and we see it's the, it's the standard uh, spams what we get for the HTTP request. Uh, if I look into the application logs, uh, you know, we see the, the logs from the agent, but also logs from the server side, so from our application. Uh, and our application has access, you know, to the variables set uh, inside the trace script. Uh, so, for example, this ID is the spin ID, which is started in the trace script. Uh, and then in the application, I can access it, I can print it, or I can even use it for, uh, as a parent, uh, for fans started in a in a business logic. This is a very simple example, but it demonstrates you know how these technology can be used to instrument the applications. Uh, and uh, if you think about you know the future work, what we can do, uh, we can for example uh, have a trace script which opens a port uh, with some kind of REST API. And we can actually upload any script uh, on the fly to our application to instrument the different parts of the uh, of our business code or uh, our middleware what we are using. And then also the REST API can also provide functionality to disable instrumentations on the fly. Uh, and what is also interesting, uh, this for me was that uh, in GraalVM you can, or with Ptrace and GraalVM, you can write the instrumentation in a different language than the application itself. So, for example, you can trace C++ application with uh, JavaScript instrumentation. Okay, this is everything that I have prepared. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. So, um, I think that's it from today. Anyone wants to add uh, one last thing? All right, um, so thank you everyone for attending. We will have another sprint demo in three weeks, Friday, same time. Uh, that's gonna be a sprint 36, and it's gonna be for uh, version 1.15. Uh, thank you everyone for joining and see you next time. Bye-bye.